Okay, so um, this is three ways to run uh, Drupal on AWS. And uh, so just a little background on, uh, on, on the talk today. Um, I, I personally don't really care uh, where you run Drupal. Uh, what, I, what I care about are, are mainly about two, two things, uh, performance and savings. And what I wanted to put out there is what if, you know, what if you can get both performance and savings without re-engineering Drupal and without getting a degree in AWS? Uh, so more than anything else, today is a talk about, uh, it's, a, it's like a case study of how others have moved their sites to the cloud and saved up to 90% on their hosting and all the while making their sites faster and not having to worry about page views and things like that. Um, so today we'll, uh, we'll show you how you can get started for yourself on AWS using their AWS's reference architecture uh, for deploying Drupal on different, in different ways. Uh, and there's certainly more than, more than three ways. So we're gonna talk about three ways. I actually have a few bonus ways. If we have time, we'll get into that um, as well. So I'm Salim Lakani. I've spent the last six years uh, automating deployments on AWS, not just for Drupal, for other applications as well, and for many different companies with many different companies. Um, we've created a dev panel to automate uh, everything that you're gonna see today. Uh, it's a point and click dashboard for Drupal deployments on AWS. Uh, and if you plan to use AWS at scale uh, with teams of developers uh, for large projects, for large sites, uh, you should check out that panel. Uh, if you're doing it for you know, uh, maybe one or two sites, then you could probably do it just, just as well uh, yourself using the methods that we're talking about today. Um, so, but today we're not, we're not here to talk about DevPanel. We're here to kind of see how you could do this on AWS yourself. So uh, let's get started and uh, uh, see if we can uh, help you save some money going forward. Okay, so next slide. Okay, so why AWS? Uh, they're, they're, uh, they've been at it the longest and uh, they're the market leader. Um, you know, they're, they're the known market leader and uh, they have points of presence across the world. So uh, when people talk about going, uh, you know, moving their infrastructure to the cloud, you know, a lot of times they're, you know, they're in, in the background, they mean AWS, but there are other cloud providers too, Microsoft, Google, a lot of the stuff that we talk about today can be done on these other cloud providers as well. Uh, there's just, the, those patterns are out there. Uh, the, the patterns that we're gonna talk about are out there and those templates are out there for them. But today we're gonna just talk about, we're just gonna focus on AWS, but, but realize that if you want to go to those other cloud providers, these templates are out there for you to do that. Yeah. Um, okay, <laughs> so when, uh, when you think about, when you think about deploying to AWS, you know, people, people think it's, uh, you know, just, uh, let me see here, just by a show of hands, uh, how many, how many people have actually deployed to AWS? Okay, you got one. I got I got me. Okay, two. We got two, three. So, uh, all right. So four. Okay, Chris. All right, five. Oh, well, maybe five. Okay. So I'll. It's it's a small group. So I'll figure. I'll figure maybe half of the folks who deployed here. Uh, is it is it easy to deploy to AWS? So uh, anyone, have you found it easy to deploy? Um, I've been using AWS for personal projects for a long time, but I 
don't really have uh, um, anything in there that I'm doing deployment with. So, okay. uh, so the answer to that would be no for me, just because I haven't, um, I haven't gotten there yeah. yet. Yeah. So, so generally, people they they come into this thing thinking it's easy to deploy, it's easy to manage. You know, it's these are the preconceptions. You know, they're. It's easy to deploy, easy to manage. It's infinitely scalable. Um, it's automatically secure. Uh, you have plug and play tools. Uh, it's all managed services. That's what's advertised. And it's uh, affordable infrastructure, right? So, so th these are all the things that are, that are marketed. But, but you, know, you, you have to think about this and you have to say that is, is that really uh, is that really how this works? And, and in our experience, unless you're using something, in my experience, unless you're using something that's already pre-cooked or templates or something like that, it's not that easy. There's a lot of check boxes that you have to go through and, uh, and, and fill this, you know, do this correctly. So uh, if you go into AWS, there is, there is over 200 products and services uh, in AWS, and if you log into their console and you go into their services drop-down box, there is, uh, you know, th there's like three pages of these services that you can uh, you can pick from. And I think they've recently simplified this uh, this menu because it was it was just so overwhelming. Um, and and it's actually true that uh, you do need a degree to to work AWS. Actually, you need many different degrees. Uh, I've I've only got a couple of these, and I have to tell you, they were not easy to to go through and get. Uh, but uh, you know, there's there's plenty of things that you know that you that you should know, and people know about uh, working AWS. So it's not something that's easy. But today. Uh, what we'll talk about today uh, does not require AWS degree, and you're not going to require any certifications. Uh, so, so that's kind of the little background on today's talk. Okay, so three three different uh, ways of doing deployments. One is the uh, the low cost way. Uh, the second is the highly available. Uh, method of doing deployments. And uh, third is the auto scaling way of uh, using their Elastic Beanstalk, uh, their AWS's proprietary way of doing things. There is uh, the bonus is the serverless way of uh, doing deployments and the static uh, websites. So those, if we, uh, I, I, hopefully we'll have time to go into those as well. So, okay, so the low cost way is using uh, what we, the, they have this product called LightSail. And let me, let me do the share with, I'm gonna share the sound as well. And I'll do some uh, annotations. Give me one second. Yeah. So if you go into if you go into uh, AWS LightSail and here's the URL for that, um, so if you go into into this URL, you'll see you'll, you'll be able to see this LightSail. It's about a thirty minute uh, tutorial, and it's uh, it's eligible for your free uh, free tier. So if you get a brand new account into AWS, you, you automatically sign up, they give you a free tier account. And, uh, and with that free tier account, you should be able to uh, uh, roll out this, this type of a Drupal instance and uh, get started with it. So let me go to this thing and, uh, and I'm gonna play this, uh, this, here's the YouTube, here's the link to the YouTube video. You can watch it even after uh, this thing. It's done by their developer advocate. I'm gonna play this video. Uh, let me know if you can hear the sound. It's a, it's a three minute video. Oh, oops.
Hi, my name is Mike Coleman. I'm a developer advocate on the LightSail team here at Amazon Web Services. Can you guys hear the sound okay? Yeah, it's fine. Okay, great. Services. And today I'm going to take you through a video that shows you some of the capabilities of Amazon LightSail. But before we get started, I just wanted to let you know that you don't have to try to do everything at the same time that I'm doing it on the screen. We've got a written guide in the description below that you can go and download. And then after the video, you can go try it all on your own. So let's get started. Today in this video, we're going to take a look at how you can deploy a Drupal instance on Amazon LightSail. We're going to start here on the LightSail homepage. I'm going to click Create Instance, and the first thing I'm going to do is choose where I want to run my instance. We have regions all across the globe. I'm in Oregon, so I'm going to pick that one because it's closest to me. You should pick a region close to you or your customer. Scrolling down, I'll choose the Drupal Blueprint, and then finally, I'll move down and I'll choose my instance size. Now, instance sizes are based on the amount of CPU, the amount of RAM, the amount of storage, disk throughput. Choose one that works for your application. I'm going to go ahead and leave mine at the default. And then finally, all I need to do is name my instance. So I'll type a name in here, and then I'm going to come down, and I'm going to click Create Instance. Now it'll take a few seconds for the instance to come up and running, so we'll pause the video and we'll rejoin it when it's running. So the instance is up and running, and what I want to do first is I want to assign a static IP address. So I'll click on the instance name and then go into networking and click create static IP. I can choose my instance from the drop down and then give the IP address a name. What I'm doing here is giving it an IP address that won't change when the instance reboots. By default, LightCell instances have dynamic IP addresses assigned to them. So if the instance was to reboot, that IP address might change, and that's not something you want in a production system. So let's go ahead now and go ahead and connect to that instance, load up our website and see how that's looking. So I'll come over here, I'll grab the IP address, and then I'm gonna move into another tab and I'm gonna paste that into my browser. And you can see the Drupal web page will come up here in just a second. Now, if I need to log into this page, because as you can see here, this is just the normal page. If I want the admin page, I'll go to user login, and it's gonna ask me for a username and password. To get the password, I need to actually connect to the instance through an SSH session. So I'll click connect here, and the password is stored in this file, Bitnami application password. And this password is unique. Every time the instance is created, a new password is generated, but it's always stored under the same file name. So I can grab that password, go back to Drupal, to the username is user, and then I can type the password in and click connect, and you can see here, now I'm in the full Drupal user, admin user interface. And so from here, I can do whatever I need to do with Drupal. So that's it. That's how easy it is to get Drupal up and running on Amazon LightSail. For more information on LightSail, go ahead and visit aws.amazon.com slash LightSail. Okay, so it's as, uh, it's as easy as that. Um, I'm gonna move this here, give me one second. So that was, uh, that was pretty easy and straightforward. Um, I've seen people move their sites from, uh, you know, some some of the major hosted platforms to LightSail, and they've gone from, you know, hundred hundred and fifty dollars a month type of hosting to ten dollars a month, and that's a good size uh, for production servers. Uh, for the for development servers, you can get away with even the three dollar fifty cent or the five dollar servers uh, very easily. The $10 servers are, are really good for production and they can, they can handle good amount of load uh, as well. So, and, and the, I'm, I'm talking small sites, they're, you know, they're, they're not big sites, but for small sites, th this is a good way to go. If you get really fancy with LightSail, you can actually set up a load balancer. You can set up multiple servers on the multiple web servers and a separate database server and things like that as well. Uh, and you can also use the RDS, which is a managed database uh, on, on AWS outside of LightSail and connect LightSail servers to that so that you actually have a managed database on the back end. So you can really get fancy with LightSail as well. Uh, so that's, that's one thing to just keep in mind is that there's a recipe, uh, there's point and click way for you to get started. And then there's, if you, if you want to get into it, you can actually go beyond the one server solution and you can set up a, you can set up a load balance solution and a light sale as well. So, so 
that's that's one way of doing it. Okay. Hi, my name is oh. Mike Coleman. I'm a developer advocate on the LightSail team. Okay. So any any questions on uh, on LightSail? Do you know what that's running in the background? Is that like Ubuntu? Um, do you know what that's uh, on, or is it like is it like Docker? What do you know what they're I, doing? They're they're running they're running a Bitnami container on uh, on Debian, I believe. So it's uh, either Debian or Ubuntu. They're running uh, the OS is Debian or Ubuntu, and then uh, you know I. It, it it even might be Amazon Linux that they're running on that uh, on as the OS. I, I'm not I'm not I don't remember uh, off the top right now. But the 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 container that they're running is the Bitnami container, and the Bitnami containers are updated very frequently, and you know they they keep those maintained. So that's uh that's the nice thing about that is that they're they're using a container that's widely used. Uh, so. That answer your question. Any other questions? Thanks. Yeah. Anybody here has used? Has anyone used LightSail in the past? It's a small group, so I'm just asking questions. So. No, I think. Oh, I okay. So Sean's used LightSail. Okay. Any good or bad experience, Sean, with it? Any like any issues? Have you have you had any issues with it? Um, it's mostly fine. I mean, it's like any other kind of virtual host that you get. It's um, they uh, you do have to treat it like a real server, though. I mean, right? You need to run the updates. You need to do those things. And you know, Linux has automated things for running security updates and stuff. And it's only one server, so when it restarts, you know. Your site's down, right? So um, maybe you don't care, but that's that's the whole, you know, if it's a big site with mission critical things, maybe light sales is the best thing for you. Yeah. So that's a that's a very good point. You're 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 this is running in a in a traditional VPS instance. This is a server that you're maintaining. So it's not there there is a container that's running inside that server, but you are responsible for maintaining that server. So if there's there are patches that come out, there's a you know whatever patches that are coming out for you you are responsible for managing that server and if you need to do backups you're responsible for doing the backups and if there's issues with it this is this is your server that you're maintaining so yeah, be had, aware of that and we had uh, once where someone set someone on campus set up a light sale and they opened the mysql port well, MySQL at some point, and it because they I don't know look to look at the database from their own tool or whatever. They opened the MySQL port. Well, MySQL got updates, uh, security updates, but or vulnerabilities, but the the site itself or the the container itself didn't get MySQL updated, hacked, removed, problems, etc. So, yeah, right. it is a server. You have to care and feed it. You know, right? Yeah. So very very good very good points. Yeah, this is uh, this is something. So it's cheap, but then again, there's you know there's pros and cons to everything. So, and this is a this is one of those things that yeah, it's cheap to to deploy, it's cheap to make, uh, on an ongoing basis. But then you have to take care of it. So that's the that's the cost of getting it for cheap. So, okay. So thank you, Sean. That was that was great. Okay. So here is here is uh, here's the high highly available solution from Amazon. So they actually have these things called quick starts. A lot of quick starts are built by different vendors. Uh, this one is built by Amazon uh, solution architects themselves. And, and there's, the, uh, there's the URL for it. And using this quick start, so, so using this quick start, you can, uh, and, and there's a deployment guide for it as well. Let me let me see if I can actually go to it. Yeah. So it goes through it goes through and talks about what you will build, um, 
So it talks about what you will build. It gives you the source code here in, uh, in the Git repo. So it, it takes you to the Git repo. It was updated, you know, what, six months ago. Uh, they've had this. Uh, it was updated, I guess, last month. Or just the code owners was updated. Um, but they've maintained it for the last five years. So this, is, this has been an ongoing project that they've maintained. Um, here, is, here is the architecture of what they're deploying. Again, this is using servers on the back end. Okay, but but uh, this is this is a highly available architecture that they've set up, and then it's a it's a essentially for you. I won't say it's a one click deployment, but they have a deployment guide. So if you can follow along, it'll uh, it'll take you through it, and you know it uh, how to deploy it. It'll, it'll walk you through the whole deployment guide details, and you know there's. Basically, there's you know you're just paying for the machines, essentially. So, um, so that's that's your that's that. And then let me look at let's look at the architecture here. So on this architecture. I, I would say this is this is kind of a dated architecture um, in, in some ways, because you've, you've got things like, you know, bastions. Bastion is, is are, are essentially servers that you can, you can use to log into your infrastructure. So you've got a, you've got a couple of bastions here. Uh, you've got the NAT gateway. This is your, this is, everything is behind the, uh, Behind behind your NAT in a in a private subnet, you've got the load balancer that's that's essentially distributing your load into two subnets and that are running in two different availability zones. So you've got availability zone one and availability zone two. Availability zones are like data centers. So if one data center goes down, the other data center is still up. But there, these are both these data centers are still in one region. In the last year, they've had AWS has had regional outages. So even if you've had like these AZs and multiple AZs, you could have had an outage. So, yeah, so, so this is this is also this uses auto scaling group. Uh, you can set it up in this solution. I think they've only got it set up so that you've got two running, but you could set it up so it automatically expands and automatically shrinks. Uh, so, so it is capable of doing that. You're using EFS, which is your uh, elastic file system. And this is the newer version of NFS. This is, they use it to actually distribute your, uh, they use it to set up your code and your files, your static files. They use the EFS for that. Um, and, and they're using memcache on, on both sides and, um, and the Aurora RDS database with a replica, uh, not a replica, but uh, uh, multi-AZ uh, RDS, so that you've got the RDS running on both the, both the data centers. So, and then, and then in the front, you've got, you've got CloudFront for static file distribution so that the static files are cached in, the, uh, in, the, in, in CloudFront in the CDN. So it's a it's a good it's a good architecture, uh, but it's a you know it it takes the guide will take you I I would say it'll take you about half a day to go through this and set up. Um, last time I had looked at it, it had it actually allowed you to set up like a dev stage and prod mm -hmm. environment. So when you set this up, it'll give you, it'll allow you to set up uh, three different environments in this. Once you set this up in this uh, architecture, you'll have, you'll get three different environments that you can, you can run. So it's, it's fairly comprehensive. Okay. And, and the code, we saw the code here. So let me clear these drawings. So you saw the code is here. You can go through the code. They've got, uh, They've got these templates 
that are here. Let me move this out of the way. So you can uh, go into these. Uh, these are all uh, CloudFront uh, uh, CloudFormation templates. So it's uh, yeah. So the, these will actually set up your applications. Um, and I'm not sure if anybody's tried this here, but has anyone tried this before? Uh, not with Drupal, but with a bunch of Lambda functions. Oh, perfect. So you've tried you've tried one of their quick starts with Lambda functions. Is that is that uh, what you? Mm, well, I've, they... I've tried this uh, similar type of architecture, but with Lambda functions. Not. I don't think I used a quick start because I don't know that they really. I, I mean, they 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 give you some guidance, you know, on how to do this kind of thing. I don't know if yeah. they call it a quick start or not, but yeah. how how did that work out for you? Works good. Yeah, it's a lot so of work. It's a lot of work. And by the way, yeah. um, that now you're starting to move into a thing that's not necessarily cheap, because I believe it's the NAT gateways. Um, one of these pieces in here costs something like thirty five dollars a month, and you're deploying two of them. So you know, yeah, it's costing you seventy dollars a month for just that architecture alone. Yeah, just to start with. Then there's whatever usage you have on the databases, etc. So yeah, it starts to, you know, it. You're not. You're, you've moved out of that um, light sale sort of price right. for sure. Right, right. And then if you're going to set up a dev test and a live instance of each one of these, you know, yeah. Oh, uh, I mean, you're probably not going to do all the load balancing and stuff in there, but yeah. Yeah. So the dev test and live. Last time I looked at it, it was all inside this. So oh, you only had to set up Good. one, and the dev test and live were all inside one. Uh, mm -hmm one of these things. Hmm, okay. That's how they had set it up. Uh, last time I take taken a look at it, but they, they, they've they kept changing. They've changed it several times. So I don't know what the latest incarnation is. Um, the, the, uh, the interesting thing to note, like Carson said, is that there is a, there's a cost to run this thing on idle. So if you're running this infrastructure, even on idle, it'll cost you it can cost you $100, maybe even $100 to $200, depending on how you've configured it, because you're running these servers on the back end. You're paying for the database on the back end. You're paying for these Elasticash, Memcache servers on the back end. These, the Drupal actually is running. These are actual EC2 servers that are running Drupal. So the, these are web servers that are running on the back end. So this is actually, even, even on idle, it can cost you $100 to $200 easy. So, so just to be aware of that, uh, but this can actually handle production load. Okay, so so this is this is a good, highly available infrastructure, and here you're not, you know, it's it's much more robust than uh, than the light sale, and you're not you're not counting page views or things like that. This is your own account, and uh, and it, it can actually auto scale up and down with you. So. Okay. Any any questions on that? We have a small group, so I just want to keep it casual and, and see if there's any questions or comments or anything like that. I mean it's pretty secure, I would say that. And then and it but it does require management for sure. Yeah. 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 Um there's, uh, I, I, you know, I didn't go into that, but uh, there's also, um, there's also this uh, AWS WAF. Um, you can look for AWS WAF Quick Start, which is their web application firewall. And, uh, and this is a really, uh, They, they, they will actually, they have a recipe themselves that they will, uh, they will set up for you. And, uh, and it's, it's really, uh, it's very affordable and uh, it'll wrap your infrastructure in a, in a firewall, app, web application firewall. So take a look at that if you're interested in, uh, 
in doing uh, setting up a firewall around your application. So is that, that's something that's helped us a lot is that we don't have to build a WAF from scratch. We can just use their quick start for that. Okay. Um, let me see. The next thing was uh, Elastic. Uh, so the, this is the their uh, Elastic Beanstalk solution. This is their own proprietary technology for AWS's proprietary technology for doing auto scaling. And they actually have a Drupal recipe for deploying the stuff on Elastic Beanstalk as well. So deploying Drupal on Elastic Beanstalk. So, so I'm going to... I'm going to play you a little bit of uh, introduction on what Elastic Beanstalk is. Are, is. are people familiar with Elastic Beanstalk here? It's by a show of hands. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll play this. Um, okay, good. So a few, few folks are. Uh, it's, it's a short video, so I'll, I'll just play this. And uh, it's a good background and introduction on Elastic Beanstalk. So. Finding the right tools to migrate, build, or modernize your cloud-based web app can be complex. With all the choices available, it can be difficult to know which ones to use. And afterwards, it's up to you to manage multiple services to provision infrastructure, handle deployments, and scale your web app. What if you could instead focus on writing code and building great web apps? Wouldn't it be nice to not have to worry about provisioning services, scaling infrastructure, or updating your platform with the latest patches? AWS Elastic Beanstalk is an easy to use service for deploying and scaling web applications and services developed with Java, .NET, Node.js, Python, and many more on familiar servers like Nginx and IIS. Elastic Beanstalk automatically manages the services needed to host and scale your application. Getting started with Elastic Beanstalk is easy. Migrate your application by uploading your source code bundle to Elastic Beanstalk using the management console or command line interface. Elastic Beanstalk returns a URL for your new web app and automatically handles the deployment details, such as provisioning, load balancing, auto scaling, and application health monitoring. You have the option to configure your web app to run on your preferred instance type or to add resources such as a virtual private cloud or a relational database. Elastic Beanstalk also provides a pathway to modernization. You can re-implement portions of your application as containerized services. Then, by linking to your existing web app, create a distributed application. With Elastic Beanstalk, you can retain control over the AWS resources powering your application, allowing you to manage as much or as little as required. Even better, there's no additional charge for Elastic Beanstalk. You pay only for the AWS resources needed to store and run your applications. With Elastic Beanstalk, you can focus on building API services, web backends, websites, content management systems, and even SaaS applications without spending a lot of time managing and configuring infrastructure. To get started, visit the Elastic Beanstalk console and get your web app running in the cloud in just a few clicks. Okay, so so that was that was uh, Elastic Beanstalk. It's a general service that you can use for many different types of applications, not just Drupal. Um, and we've used it, uh, you know, even even with the DevPanel platform, we deploy we can deploy Elastic Beanstalk infrastructure and and Drupal on top of that. Um, so so it's a it's a very flexible. Uh, platform itself. It is proprietary to to AWS, so it's not like Kubernetes based or anything like that. But uh, it's it's flexible. It works. It's solid. And uh, has has anyone here used Elastic Beanstalk? I, I guess a couple of folks have, right? Like Sean, have, what has your experience been? Um, we used it to deploy some Laravel apps. Um, we haven't used it for Drupal. We did a proof of concept once for a major uh, WordPress multi-site, um, but it's been working fine for, for Laravel. The only thing is um, it, it deploys a lot of stuff. And like it said in the video, it's it will deploy all that on your account. So if like you use your account for a bunch of other stuff and you turn this on and suddenly there's like 
three S3 buckets and a load balancer and, you know, all these things with random UUID names show up all over the place. Like, what is all this crap? Like, well, right. that's what it did, right? So uh, what we, we're starting to do is whenever we have a customer that needs something like that, we'll spin up a totally separate account and right. say, like, look, just keep all this stuff in one account so it doesn't mix in with everything else. Um, yeah. But the upgrading is easy because, you know, if you need to upgrade um, the containers and they will tell you like, hey, there's the, you know, there's updated containers, you can, uh, you can upgrade one container and then the load balancer will move over, you know, if it works, the load balancer move over to that and you can upgrade the other containers. So it's, uh, yeah. it does make for pretty good, for pretty good uptime. And the fact that there's no server really um, to, to manage helps, you know, then, then you don't have to worry about updating OS soft, you know, OSs or or you have to update the the machine or the container image, I guess, from time to time, but it's a simple process. Yeah, I think you've you've hit everything just like on uh, the uh, on the head. It was hundred percent. Was uh, you know we've had we've had really good success with uh, Elastic Beanstalk when we've deployed it for clients, and uh, the 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 one thing is, yeah, it does create all these things that. It needs its own infrastructure, you know. It needs all these components to kind of manage and coordinate all these things itself, all the services itself. So, a lot of times you don't know what's going on and what all the things that it's creating. And so, so what we do is create these uh, child accounts in the AWS organization, and then deploy uh, these application uh, Elastic Beanstalk applications in those child accounts. So you're still maintaining admin control of the child account, but it's it's completely uh, isolated, <clears throat> and that that actually helps with the billing as well, so that you can see exactly what you're being billed for on the EBS side, uh, on the Beanstalk side. So, um, and then and then yeah, the the updates and uh, and scaling is uh, is just amazing. It's just it takes care of all of that, all of those things. So it's all parameter driven. So we're we're big fans of this, uh, and uh, it's it's a good service. So, so something you can look at um, here is the uh, you know here is uh, again this is it, it might take half a day to a day to go through this, uh, but it's you know it's something that's it's worthwhile. It's a referenced architecture. It's it's. It's there. It's people have used it. It's uh, you, you'll be successful at doing it. So, um, and then and then here's the uh, the code for it. The code, you know, it's a uh, it's a little little bit old. So, uh, you know, depending, you you'll have to go through it. You'll see there's still instructions on Drupal eight five three. So as you go through it, you'll have to be careful on what you're deploying and how you're deploying things and so on. But uh, but it's a it's solid uh, it's solid infrastructure that you're deploying. Okay. Any any questions on this? Okay, so I'll go I'll go to the to the next one. How are we doing on time, uh, Andrea? Um, it looks like you have about um, 15 minutes left. Okay, perfect. So we have we have plenty of time here. So, okay. So, um, so serverless is another, you know, when we say serverless, um, you know, people, people instantly think of, uh, of lambdas, right? So on uh, lambdas are great for uh, for stateless applications, but for Drupal, when we talk serverless, uh, we're talking containers, and we're talking um, we're talking generally talking Kubernetes or even Elastic Beanstalk and things like that, right? So if we're talking containers, uh, we go into cloud native territory, we go into Kubernetes, and they actually have a recipe for that as well. And and this is this is. It's written in one of their uh, one of their blog posts, so it's not an official official. You know their their quick starts, but uh, it's something that's uh, 
it was done recently, just last year, and uh, uses Fargate, which is container orchestration, uh, container runtime, uh, serverless container runtime, and EFS, which is their elastic file system, and uh, RDS, and, and all the. Let, let me let me go to it. Let's see if we can. So here's their their write up for it. Um, and here is the infrastructure that they're deploying. And uh, they they actually give you the the code for it, the YAML, the you know the the repo is there, and they walk you through how to deploy it. So it's uh, they've done they've done some work on it already. So you can should be able to go through this and uh, and deploy it. And I'll walk you through this a little bit their architecture. So they're running this on, you'll see that they've got, they've got three different AZs. They've got three different availability zones here. So this is availability zone one, this is AZ2 and AZ3. And, and then each of the AZs they've got, you know, like, You've got the NAT gateway, uh, like we were talking about. You've got the public subnet. You've got one load balancer that's actually distributing traffic to all three different zones, and you've got uh, you've got this is all managed by uh, this is all running in Fargate. So Fargate's running three tasks in three different zones. So you've got three containers running. In different zones, and then all of this is managed by uh, Aurora Serverless. This is a serverless database, uh, and it will scale automatically. And and to be honest, we've had some issues with uh, performance issues with serverless version one, serverless version one of the serverless RDS. Um, the version two is scales much more smoothly. And uh, so try that, you know, when you're when you're into serverless and see if that works better for you. That that was one thing that we've we've gone back and forth on is uh, the serverless RDS that we just at times we've just gone to the regular RDS and away from the serverless R RDS. Um, they've also got the EFS with the different mount points for each of the for each of the AZs, and. You know, this is a it's a good it's a good infrastructure. Uh, it works well. Sometimes you can have performance issues with uh, with EFS at times, but uh, if you follow their guidance, uh, you know, I think I think you can mitigate some of those uh, some of those issues. So, so that's that's their serverless solution, and uh, you know. Do we use that? Like, have we used that in production? We've actually taken this and modified it uh, for production use. So we haven't used exactly this, but we've used that as a, we've used this as a starting point in uh, for many projects. So, so it's a it's a good point. It's a good one to play with and see see if you wanna if you wanna use it. And then my my favorite one is the static sites, because I I have to tell you most of many Drupal sites are, you know, just I think they're just catalog sites with uh, with forms and uh, and search, and uh, and if you can make them if you can turn them into a static site with the ability to do incremental updates to just to the pages that you're modifying, right? Then, then do you actually need a dynamic site that's out there and that's vulnerable to, uh, to hacking attempts and to, you know, that's, that's running all this engineering behind it. So can you turn it into a static site and just run it out of uh, S3 buckets? And so static sites are, are also serverless they're fast, they're cheap, and, uh, and they scale really, really well. So these are by far my, uh, my favorite. Um, and and they're, uh, you, you can tell they're, uh, they're very expensive to run. 
because uh, you know they're typically uh, what one to three dollars a month. So I'm I'm kidding. It's uh, so you can actually th this is this is not for Drupal, but there is a there's a demo for static sites. You can actually go through it and deploy this. Uh, it's for the it'll, it'll fit in the free tier. It'll take you about ten minutes to to complete this demo, and uh, I'll show you how static sites work. So they're all based on S3 and CDN. And, and with Drupal, you can actually create static sites using a project called Tome. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with this. Has anyone here used Tome? I, I feel like we're in Ferris Bueller here, so. Anyone? No? Okay, so Tome, it's, it, uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work with Drupal 7. Um, it does work with 8 and 9. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's, a great, it's a great project. So uh, it'll, it'll walk you through. It comes with, you, you get instructions on how to deploy it on Netlify. Um, there, there's two versions of it, Tome Static and Tome Sync. You can read about it. It comes with a built-in Drupal search. I actually, with the Tome sites, the static sites, I actually like to use this uh, search engine called Algolia. So look into, if you're looking for a good search for static sites, look into Algolia. Um, it's a, it's, just amazing. And uh, but but Tome is uh, is something you, you want to look at for uh, for static sites. And I think that's any anyone running, by the way, is anyone running static sites? Drupal static sites? Nobody? Yeah, I, Salim, I am. Um, but kind of what we've done is there's some sites that we've decided to archive. And it's like, we, we just don't, I mean, we will never need to, uh, to update the site again, right? It was an event that happened long ago. We just don't need it to run Drupal anymore. I haven't used Tome. Um, I'm very interested in that. Um, yeah, what, what have you used? What did you use? So we used an app called Site Sucker. Uh, okay. And so it's a free app for Mac. Um, I, I actually, I don't know if it's free. I know it's in the app store, um, but you can search for it as well. And it's it just a scraper and it does a remarkably, and so that's a similar, that's a similar product there too. Um, yeah. So that's a, it, it basically does the same, same thing as that. It just scrapes all the HTML, creates HTML files, sticks them in a folder and, and changes all the links. It looks at all the links and makes sure that any of the links that, you know, are not relative on the site become relative, right? That sort of thing. Um, and then I just upload it to, to S3. The only difference um, is that with Site Sucker anyway, it actually creates, the, the files that it creates are .html files. And so like, if you have links to your site, you know, Drupal doesn't use .html at the end of its paths, obviously. So if you have a lot of links in, they'll get a lot of 404s because they'll try to hit the page without .html. Um, and so that's a little unfortunate. Um, I did a little thing with JavaScript to make an error.html uh, error file that uses JavaScript to just stick the HTML on the end of the file. Um, but uh, but it, that doesn't do like a 301 redirect, but it works, I mean, works great. We can keep the URL and people don't notice that the site just isn't Drupal anymore. Yeah, yeah. There's, a, there's another one that, uh, that we're partnering with at uh, DevPal, it's called QuantCDN. And, and uh, so take a look at QuantCDN. What we are doing with it uh, on the DevPanel side is that uh, we're, you know, DevPanel does the dev test live environment. And then from, from we create an editorial site uh, that people can log into and do their edits on uh, in Drupal, and then they can actually push out a static site using this quant CDN. 
And with Quant CDN, you can actually do incremental updates. And it has support for, uh, for uh, search and it has support for, uh, for forms uh, out of the box. So uh, even if you're hosting on one of the, you know, the big hosting companies, you can actually use this as a front end and you could turn off your uh, production sites. If you, if you, you can turn off your dynamic sites or have those behind the firewall. And, uh, and then if you update those, you can actually push those from behind the firewall onto your static site. You can, you can push out you know, incremental updates. So you don't have to update the entire site. You can just update one page at a time. So this is something to look at as well. This is a, it's a very good product. Um, so on that, the, when you say forms, do you mean web forms? And I think that may uh, answer also Syed's question there, I think maybe. Yeah. Yeah, web form. Well, no, not Drupal web forms. You have to create your own forms. In Quant? Uh, yeah, in Quant, yeah. Okay. Uh, it has an external form. Uh, it allows you to build forms externally, so yeah. How does Tome handle that? Does that do anything with uh, web forms or? No, you have to, you have to create your own, uh, you have to create your own forms as well. So you can, you can look into documentation and, uh, yeah, and is, is this forms. tome is this incremental or is this like it's gonna do a whole generate generate a whole brand new thing once you hit save on a if you use tome sync it's uh it's incremental but then you have to have a front end you have to have a separate uh decouple site to use tome sync and then then you can do you can use you can use uh incremental updates with tome sync cool. yeah but yeah, Tome, Tome can do incremental updates. It's not as graceful. It's not as uh, it's not as flexible as Quant CDN. But yeah, it can do that. Yeah, yeah it's a uh, forms externally. You know, for discussion, I would I would use Discuss or some other discussion board if you need that. Um, and then for search, I would use, I would just use Algolia or Lunar, but uh, Lunar is free, Algolia you have to pay for, but they have a free tier and uh, it's, it's just amazing. And I think they have faceted search uh, capability. So you can do faceted search for Drupal as well. So, so that's, that's my talk. Um, You have questions uh here's my contact information if you need to reach out to me uh but that's that's about it uh was this useful yeah this was really great i really enjoyed this talk okay Good overview. that's very helpful yeah any any other feedback like uh what what else would you have liked to have seen i'm, I'm trying to improve this so i'd like uh, i'd like some feedback if uh, if you don't mind yeah, I mean, I'm already on AWS and running Ubuntu 14.04. And so um, with a personal site, like, like an e-commerce site, and I'm trying to think about if I want to, um, you know, move to Ubuntu 18, or if I want to do like light sale or, or one of these containers and which would be more secure, because I don't think the site that I have is that secure actually. Yeah. So it seems like a lot of options are here. Oh, there's some questions here. Okay, so um, yeah, static website. How do you handle contact pages? Uh, we we talked about that. So it's external. Uh, you have to build those, and then uh, monthly cost for Elastic Beanstalk. I you know I would go in. I would go in at a at a hundred bucks, um, thinking it'd be like a. On the low end, it could be like a hundred bucks, or or even more. What what do you think, Carson? You know, the problem is that that depends. But I know, but I know that I know that um, there's some good cost uh, analysis tools that Amazon's come out with that can kind of probably help you figure this stuff out a little bit, uh, depending on what your individual needs are. Everybody kind of has a different thing and you know how much traffic you have and 
where it's coming from, etc. So, yeah, I mean, it's hard to say that, but I think, you know, just as a, as a piece of feedback for this presentation, what might be helpful to people is to see, you know, for one particular site with a particular use case or whatever, what, what would those cost differences or security differences or what the, um, you know, maintenance, you know, times, you know, how much time you're going to have to spend maintaining each one of these, you know, solutions for a, a, a given use, you know, a, a site with a given use case. Um, that being said, you know, you have to pick one that, uh, pick a use case that kind of makes sense that would make sense for each one of these options. But, um, you know, or, or maybe an indicator of when it might be the right time to switch from one of the cheaper options like say light sale and then okay now it's time to kind of upgrade into something like elastic beanstalk or something like yeah that. what yeah. indicators are that you look for to figure that's a out good point how how do you know when it's time to switch or how do you know when you're ready when you'd be ready to go to this yeah yeah, yeah. another thing um is that uh th this may not be a perfect solution, but LightSail does have a solution where, hey, have you graduated past this? Click this button and we'll convert these to real EC2 instances that you can now, you know, manage and, and stuff like that. So oh, that's cool. LightSail has an uh, kind of an upgrade. They won't like upgrade it to Elastic Beanstalk because the infrastructure and the architecture is, you know, radically different. Um, but I want to echo what Carson said. I think, you know, what would be really interesting, Salim, is if you did each one of these and literally installed bare core Drupal and let it sit there for a month, <laughs> um doing nothing and receiving no traffic like what is the absolute baseline cost of like carson said running the nat gateways can be kind of expensive i know that in uh in elastic beanstalk you have to run well you might be able to run aurora now but you used to have to run rds which took an ec2 instance like it had to had to keep that up all the time we ran into where we we spun up the same size ec2 or you know rds instance for the dev test and live and then just let the dev and test run. And it cost us like, you know, $150 a month. And we didn't even realize it for a couple months. I'm like, what the heck is this? So just seeing what the baseline cost is of doing absolutely, you know, the fresh site with no traffic. Would yeah, be just running on idle. Yeah. Yeah, running on idle for a month. And, or, I mean, you can speculate. So running on idle for a day and then calculate it times 30 or something just to yeah. see what, um, what it runs. Beanstalk's easy because they tell you that, right? That's what's nice about Beanstalk. There's no surprise. I mean, not not Beanstalk, um, light sale, because there's no there's no surprises. They just say, look, this is what it costs. Yeah. I'm gonna stop the recording. If if you guys want me to leave this open and if there's further discussion, I'm happy to do that. I think other sessions are starting. Yeah, yeah. So uh, 